Good morning. Welcome to the Boise Unitarian Universalist Fellowship's Zoom worship service. We are so glad you have joined us this morning. Whoever you are and wherever you are on your spiritual journey, you are welcome here. Whoever you love and however you identify, you are welcome here. Whatever fades you have known, if any, you are welcome here. I want to take a moment to specifically welcome any newcomers among us. If you are joining us for the first or second time, welcome. We know it takes a lot of courage to find and seek out a new community, and we are delighted that you have chosen to be with us this morning. I invite you to introduce yourself in the chat so that we can warmly welcome you and we'll post a link to our newcomer form. If you'd like to fill that out, then we can add you to all of our mailing lists so you can keep up to date with all that is happening in our fellowship. And there are so many ways for us to connect virtually and a few ways for us to connect in person as we slowly start to regather in small groups. I want to just remind everybody that after the worship service today is our annual congregational meeting, the time of year we gather together to approve our budget and vote for new board members. All members of the congregation are encouraged to attend and cast your vote as we honor our democratic process and principles. We'll get started shortly after the worship service and we will not have our breakout rooms today. I also want to take a moment to invite all of you next Saturday, May 22nd, to an outdoor, in-person anniversary celebration in honor of our 60th anniversary. Today's service celebrates and honors 60 plus years of Unitarian Universalism nationally and locally. We share this honor with our Unitarian Universalist Association. So we want to celebrate in community together by gathering in our beautiful space on Saturday at 11 a.m. from 11 to 1. We'll have some stations and activities throughout the grounds that you can enjoy on your own. We'll have a food truck here. And at the end of the celebration at 1230, we will invite our graduating seniors to cross the bridge in our annual bridging ceremony that commemorates their milestone. So we hope that you'll come out and join us. Each week when we gather, we want to take a moment to acknowledge and recognize the land upon which our church and homes exist. We recognize this is the ancestral land stolen from the Shoshone, Bannock, Paiute, Nez Perce, and many other tribes who inhabited a vast region, including much of Idaho, before they were rounded up and forced to leave. Our land has a long history, long before colonization, and we recognize that our presence here today is founded upon the exclusions and erasures of many indigenous people. And with our acknowledgement, each week, we wish to demonstrate our commitment to beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Native peoples live among us today and we honor their ancestral connection to this land and support their right to sovereignty. And in the challenges of those truths, of this acknowledgement, we invite one another to move through the world bringing justice in every way that we can listening to the truths spoken to us by Native American peoples and making space for them to re-inhabit this place, giving them back the resources they need to heal their communities. As I mentioned, today's service celebrates 60 plus years of Unitarian Universalism nationally and locally. It's a special service today. We explore our monthly spiritual theme of story by sharing our story where we came from, and how we came to be who we are today, and what story we hope to tell of who we will become in the future. Sixty years ago, this very weekend, two historic milestones took place. This fellowship declared itself an official religious organization filing their incorporation papers with the state of Idaho, 
And on this very same weekend, the Unitarians and Universalists in 1961 voted to consolidate, merging the American Unitarian Association and the Universalist Church of America into the Unitarian Universalist Association. We honor 60 years of Unitarian Universalism in the Treasure Valley and in our nation. I want to offer a special thanks to Gwyn and Bill Reed. This sermon is actually an auction sermon. They were the winners of the choose your own sermon topic from our auction in 2020. I'm a little bit behind on my auction sermons. And as two who are deeply connected to our local history and to our Unitarian Universalist history, Gwyn having grown up and come of age with her sister Nancy Harms in this very church, they requested our history be the topic of their sermon and it felt fitting to honor it on this day together with our Unitarian Universalist Association history and on the day of our annual meeting when we exercise that free democratic right of our congregations to exert their own authority over how they are run. This lineage, this governance structure goes way back to the very founding of Unitarianism and Universalism. In the sermons and reflections today, we have not captured it all. There are so many more stories worthy of our continued exploration and learning. But we've captured a bit of the story of us, and we share it with you today. So as we prepare to enter this time of worship together, I invite you to breathe with me. To fill your body with breath and breathe knowing that we are connected to one another and to this larger community of faith. Through our very breath, we are connected to the lineage and legacies from where we've come, building a future for where we wish to go. As you hear the words of our opening poem. I invite you to hear the thines and the thous this morning as a reflection to that part of our Unitarian Universalist faith tradition that calls to you. Thou art the song of my heart in the morning. Thou art the dawn of truth in my soul. Thou art the dew of the roses adorning. Thou art the woven whole. Thine is the grace to be steadfast in danger. Thine is the peace that none can destroy. Thine is the face of the need-driven stranger. Thine are the wings of joy. Thou art the deep, to the deep in me calling. Thou art a lamp where my feet shall tread. Thy way is steep past the peril of falling. Thou art my daily bread. Thine be the praise of my spirit uplifted. Thou art the sea to each flowing stream. Thine be the days that are gathered and sifted. Thou art the deathless dream. In May 1961, when the Unitarians and Universalists gathered for that final vote to consolidate and merge, here is a picture of what that service looked like to commemorate the event during an annual meeting at Boston Symphony Hall. We have with you, we want to share with you some reflections from our Unitarian Universalist Association of three ministers who were active at the time of the merger, two Unitarians and one Universalist, one of which became our Unitarian Universalist Association president later in his career. 
I was in Richmond, Virginia, when the merger uh, discussion was going on. Um, I don't remember being too involved in it because I was too involved in other things, uh, civil rights and whatnot. So merger wasn't really high on my agenda. But I do remember that I preached against it. Um, <laughs> and I chuckle now because the congregation voted for it. So that was how much influence the minister had. Learned that ease early in the game. I'm not certain why I uh, was opposed to it, but in thinking about it, I think I was influenced by A. Pal Davies, for one thing. And uh, I went to one of these, stumbled into one of these meetings, and there were like 50 people packed into this, I won't say smoke-filled room, but it, you know, it was a caucus room. And Powell Davies, this person whose books I had and whom I admired so, and I actually had heard him preach once, amazing man, uh, but he was leading an effort to oppose merger. And so that was very disappointing to me and uh, uh, disillusioning. Well, it was during my last years in seminary. In fact, I was already engaged to be married. My husband-to-be and I went to a conference in Andover in the summer of 53. And we heard that this was coming and we thought it was a great idea, we as individuals. My own feeling at the time was that the, there was a great deal of enthusiasm and excitement on the expansion of Unitarianism, especially in the South and really throughout the country, but it was the height of the fellowship movement and people were really excited about this. And I felt that this would divert our attention from, from growing. Somehow Unitarians would be held back by that kind of uh, uh, emphasis and resources being put into merger at that particular time. On the Universalist side, I think there was a fear that they might be swallowed up. I always had this very positive uh, uh, feeling about merger. It was like a non-issue for me. And I wasn't surprised when the two plebiscites in the late 50s were you know, pretty overwhelmingly positive. The final one, I think, was about 90% uh, of congregations voting, both Unitarian Universalist, for, uh, for consolidation. You can put it either way. It's something that should have been done a long time ago, and now we're ready to do this, and, and uh, we want to join with the Unitarians. Or uh, we are poor, and we are losing ground, and we jolly well better join with somebody who's a little bit more successful, or we're going to be in real trouble. Uh, but it was also a very exciting time. It was, there was a great deal of enthusiasm, and, and hopes were high for the future. Uh, of the movement. It was kind of a, we're almost ready to hug each other, even though we've never felt Unitarians were very huggable, but it was kind of a, uh, what we've been waiting for and kind of urging onward has finally happened. The highlight of the meetings in Boston that where the two groups were consolidated was the service at Symphony Hall, uh, where they had the pulpit from Channing and from uh, and of, uh, Hosea Ballou. We were very, very excited. Some of our parishioners, former parishioners from the South had come up because it was a big event for them too. Immediately after the, after the merger and Dana Greeley had been elected president. It was understood that as one of the aspects of merger, Philip and his counterpart and the Unitarians, uh, Dana McLean Greeley, would each step down gracefully, graciously, whatever, and a new person would be chosen to head the new organization. And when the time came, Phil stepped down, but Dana McLean Greeley kept right there. There were those, I think, who feel in retrospect that uh, uh, the Universalists got the short end of it, and uh, sheer numbers helped uh, determine that, perhaps. But then in the 60s, we develop the, developed a number of controversies within the, the movement, the Black Power Movement, for instance, the Vietnam War. This tended to fracture parts of the association, and so the whole thing sort of slowed down, uh, that we didn't realize the growth that we had hoped for, and that we become, became consumed with these various issues within the, the movement over the long run that it has proved to be a very beneficial thing that 
that uh, resulted from the, uh, uh, from the merger. My favorite authors was John Cheever, and this to me is as good a mission statement as any for our future, and that is to, uh, he was speaking of the mission of being a writer, but I see it as our mission as well, to build small shelters of hope and to illuminate life's darkened ways. Marion Franklin Ham wrote the lyrics to our centering music in advance of the first hymnal shared by the American Unitarian Association and the Universalist Church of America. The hymnal was called Hymns of the Spirit. It was intentionally written to celebrate this growing relationship between the two denominations who were beginning, continuing to work together and finding it useful and and moving early on in those years towards consolidation. And as the final votes were cast in that service in Boston in May 1961, the assembled body sang this hymn together as tranquil streams. At this hour, in small towns and big cities, in living rooms and ornate sanctuaries, many of our sibling Unitarian Universalists are also lighting a flaming chalice, reminding us that we are part of a great community of faith. We light a chalice each week to remind us of the future for which we struggle and the hope of beloved community. You're invited to light your chalice and then share in the chat where you have lit the flame this morning. May this dancing flame inspire us to fill our lives with the Unitarian Universalist ideals of love, justice, and truth. As we collectively light our chalices, we share with you this call to worship adapted from Amanda Pope for our current virtual spaces. This is the home that love made. It is full of the love that the founders felt when they envisioned the future from living rooms and community basements. When others realized that vision in a once pastoral pasture and planned out the walls and raised the beams in the sanctuary where we will worship once again. When they imagined and lovingly carved the little bridge and cared for the gardens and grounds we enjoy. This is the home that love made. It is full of the love of all who have worshiped here and in this virtual space we now share. 
Those is, who have celebrated and grieved, the babies dedicated, couples married, and family members mourned here and in this virtual space we now share. This is the home that love made. It is full of the love of our children as they learn and laugh together, and our youth as they grow into their own sense of purpose and meaning. We give them, we see them on our screens and marvel at how much they've grown. This is the home that love made. It is full of the love of the staff who have served it, full of their hopes for this congregation, their hard work, and their acts of dedication. This is the home that love made. It is full of the love of the choir, the love made so clear in the voices lifted there on Sunday mornings, and voices heard from choirs across the country, brought to us through the magical science of the internet and the diligent magic of human creativity. This is the home that love made. It is full of our love, the love of this community, despite our differences and disagreements, the love that holds us together as a people, even when separated by miles. This is the home that love made. Can you feel it? May we feel at home as now we light our chalices, the symbol of free thought, the beacon of universal love for humankind. Come, let us worship together. I invite everyone to cozy up for our time for all ages this morning. You, you congregations share a lot in common. We talk about our eighth principles and six sources and how to best live them. We create covenants about how to share space and love and effort with each other. We share food, Sunday mornings, and a hope for loving communities. But no two UU communities are the same. Often our uniqueness is rooted in a very particular event in our history, a fire, an act of justice, a new building, creating a memorial garden, an argument even, or a church member who became famous. Being a people of story is more than what's on our library shelves, picture books and fairy tales. Stories tell us who we are. Story is what keeps a unique, momentous event alive. And even more importantly, story is what enables that event to become the glue that binds a community together. This is the story of the Little Bridge, a landmark in our outdoor sanctuary and a lasting memory of how imagination and loving effort has made our Boise UU community unique. This event is extra special to us because it connects us to another community, to our per partner church in Transylvania, and to our Unitarian historical roots in Hungarian culture. So our story this morning is an adaptation of Little Bridges' story, which was originally written by Wanda Jennings and Treva Mayas. The original with all its beautiful pictures is in both our children's library and our grown-ups library. So this is such a special story and I am incredibly grateful to our readers, Gwen Reed, Wanda Jennings, Alan and Mary Schwartzman, Edith Hope, and Barbara Alexander, who were all part of the wave of helping hands that made Little Bridge such an important part of who we are. 
Once upon a time, there were two groups of people who believed that everything in the world is connected. One group was the Boise Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, which was near a lovely river in Garden City, Idaho. The other was their sister church in the town of Mesku, which was far away in the beautiful countryside of Transylvania. They dreamed of a way to build a bridge of friendship between the two churches to practice their belief in the world's interconnection. A major part of Unitarian Universalist history comes from Transylvania, where Unitarianism was first articulated and organized. What an important thing to honor. The people of Mayskew and of Boise were dreaming of one, one another. They wrote letters back and forth, sharing their joys and sorrows and their vision of an interconnected world. A great joy for the people of Mayskew was the tulip, which is the national flower of Hungary. A tulip, it is embroidered, carved in wood, painted and planted everywhere. Members of the churches practiced learning each other's languages, English and Hungarian, to better speak with each other. They would save up funds for special visits to one another to see the beauty of each other's town. This is when the people of Boise learned the cultural beauty of tulips. They were holding space in their hearts to let their friendship change who they were as people. How might this friendship change how they lived? On the beautiful land at the Boise Church, there was a small but strong creek. The creek supported mallard ducks, frogs, cattails, a grove of trees, and all sorts of plant and bug life. The people had put a wooden board over the water to cross the stream to Jeremiah's adventure garden. The board wobbled when walked upon and it dug into the banks of the creek. And not everyone was able to use this board to access the gardens and grove. There needed to be a safe way to cross that protected the creek. One day, a dream was born. It became Little Bridge. The people of the Boise Church began to feed and care for the dream of Little Bridge. They gave love and energy to it. It started with a couple of people who shared this dream with their community. The more they shared, the more ideas and passion others felt. More and more people joined into work and dream of what this bridge could be like. It was an act of love for the people to serve as helping hands for this dream. They wanted to see Little Bridge grow. They began to carve posts with the designs from Transylvania, the tulips and geometrical shapes. One day they brought in a huge crane. The crane picked up two heavy steel girders in its strong grip and set the girders across the stream to give power and strength to the foundation. They drilled holes for huge bolts to help keep Little Bridge strong and started bolting together the support beams. The builders knew that many people from around the world would cross over this stream by building a strong foundation and sturdy rails Little Bridge could be a safe, welcoming path for everyone. One person thought that trolls lived under Little Bridge. He had been listening to many stories from his friend about trolls coming to Boise seeking haven or safety. He jumped into the water to see if he could meet any trolls. What do you think he discovered? He found out how wet and muddy the creek is and learned a little of what it's like to be a frog 
in the creek. The people knew they wanted to help people stay dry and let the frogs and trolls alone. Little Bridge got railings to hold people on its walkway and keep them safe. They made a roof like the ones in Transylvania with a crown on the top. People carved tulips into those railings and roof timbers to dress Little Bridge up. They also cut two other designs into the railings, but they are a surprise. See if you can figure out the surprise shape next time you're on the bridge. It took hours and hours and hours. Many people had to dedicate themselves to be helping hands. From ages five to 70, the people watched and helped, dreamed and worked, shared and laughed together. Now, Little Bridge stands tall and beautiful. It's a bridge of friendship between the Boise UU Fellowship and their partner church in Mesco, Transylvania. We're so proud to have loving people who worked hard to make this bridge that will last for generations. Sometimes we have a big party specifically for our connection to the people of Mesco. We share Hungarian music. We have a parade over Little Bridge. We bring flowers. We have special things to eat and drink. We take pictures of all of us around Little Bridge and send them to Transylvania. The end. Or a truly wonderful beginning. I wonder, do you have any memories at the Little Bridge? Maybe you've run across on your way to play with your siblings and church friends. Maybe you've crossed the bridge as part of a ceremony with our whole congregation, with our minister and young adults leading the way with a big lantern. The next time you are out on the church grounds, I invite everyone to take a moment for a special practice. As you stand on one side of the bridge, pause with a big breath, exhale. Then think of a loving thought that you can take across Little Bridge today. A loving thought for the world where everything is connected. What do you wish for other people? How can you share something that brings you joy? It was an act of love for the people to serve as helping hands for this dream. It was an act of love for the people to serve as helping hands for this dream. It was an act of love for the people to serve as helping hands for this dream. It was an act of love for the people to serve as helping hands for this dream. It was an act of love for the people to serve as helping hands for this dream. It was an act of love for the people to serve as helping hands for this dream. I want to take an extra moment to thank all of the people who are part of such an important piece of our history and to thank our wonderful readers who were part of that video and part of that history. I. Um, I'm tearing up. Every time I've watched that video, I've teared up. I see some of you are as well. Um, I want to end with this blessing that may no acts of love go unforgotten. Um, I will also say, I invite everyone to join in singing our community blessing as we honor this truly multi-generational community that is full of ever learning, ever growing, ever 
justice and love seeking beloveds. Thank you all. Jim, that was amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Barb and Gwyn and Wanda and Alan and Mary and Edith and all of the hands and all of those pictures that brought this bridge to life. Not only is the bridge a treasure for all of us in this community and for Unitarian Universalism, but that we have this story now captured on video. It is on our YouTube channel anytime you want to go back and watch it feels like an added bonus to the acts of love that brought this bridge to life. And I'm one of the ones that can't stop tearing up. Um, I just feel so blessed to be a part of this community with so many acts of love. It's a beautiful story, the story of our little bridge, and it stands along so many stories that make up the larger story of us. Every time I look through photos and dig around in our archives, I'm amazed at what I find. Stories of passion and dedication and hope and deep love, even amidst the controversies and contentions that naturally arise in any community that has been around and with each other for so long. And there still exists a core thread, core values and commitments that have been our foundation even as we've struggled to grow and evolve and adapt with the changing times. Long before the helping hands and acts of love that brought our little bridge to life, making it a vital part of our story, Unitarians gathered in the Treasure Valley with hopes and dreams of creating a new church community. Our Boise story begins at the turn of the 20th century. The American Unitarian Association sent forth missionary ministers charged with planting churches in new cities on the western frontier. Yes, at one time we had missionary church planters in our denomination. In those early years, Boise Unitarians had four different ministers until the arrival of the Reverend John Mitchell, determined to fill that charge and build a church. Reverend Mitchell took out a small ad in the newspaper, inviting all liberal-minded Christians to meet together with him at a local spot in Boise. The city at that time was booming. Mining was a big in industry, and a few Unitarians from the Midwest and back East had relocated here. By 1907, they had a dedicated membership that had grown to around 100 people. They'd purchased property and they were working on a building. But as is the challenge of so many churches year after year and decade after decade, they needed money. So Reverend Mitchell wrote to the National Women's Alliance appealing for funds. Here is an excerpt of his more than seven page handwritten letter. He writes, I am therefore intensely anxious to make the Boise Church the headquarters of a grand missionary enterprise. Think of it. Our church is the only church of the liberal Christian faith in this great empire state. The most very cruel notions of religion prevail throughout this state. Unitarians are regarded as infidels and as enemies to the Christian religion. I am sure there is no place in this great country of ours that is worthy 
and needs so much help as this vast missionary field having the city of Boise for a center. Oh, this work must not fail. Those were Reverend Mitchell's words. And no matter how much change and evolution happens in our history, there's always threads that rear up again and again that seem to continue, that stay with us, that become ingrained in our story and our identity. The most very cruel notions of religion prevail throughout this state. Indeed, we have witnessed firsthand how those cruel notions shut out and shut down so many people. How those notions attempt to make false claims about the indoctrination of our children and rewrite our ever-evolving story. I came here to Boise in part following a similar call as Reverend Mitchell, desiring to give some resistance to the majority status quo, to raise a voice for liberal religion, seeing this place, this state, this vast missionary field as worthy and in need of the pursuits and values of our Unitarian Universalist faith. Oh, this work must not fail. But there was a failure of sorts. Reverend Mitchell moved on to help start churches in other Western cities, and within a few years, the church suspended its services and activities due to a lack of funds. There was also some evidence that there was a bit of rancor and contention that had bubbled up near the end of their time with Reverend Mitchell. On March 11, 1912, another small article appeared in the Idaho Statesman. Its headline read, Boise Unitarian Church closed indefinitely. It broke my heart to read that headline, knowing that our Unitarian ancestors couldn't sustain their hopes and dreams for our liberating faith in this valley. I sometimes wonder if Reverend Mitchell ever heard about the closing of the church if someone had sent him that article. I wonder if he felt it as a failure of his own in some way. If only John Mitchell and those early Unitarians could see us now. Could they have known then, in 1907, what would become of their legacy? Here we are today, in 2021, nearing the 300 member mark, with beautiful property, an amazing building, a thriving beloved community dedicated to justice equity and compassion, committed to making change and advocating for voices on the margins, a community which has been worshiping entirely online, physically distant from one another for more than a year. Could Reverend Mitchell have imagined then that his name would be remembered and the passion of his congregation and his, their passion for liberal faith in this empire state where it was reviled and dismissed, would be held up as a grand vision still relevant more than 110 years later. Could he have known that he planted seeds of Unitarianism that would eventually grow to become this thriving fellowship? Thankfully, the indefinite closure did not last. It was resurrected by some passionate Unitarians and has been growing and evolving and becoming a thriving spiritual home for so many and a beacon of justice in our community. But it took 26 years. 26 years passed with some intermittent gathering of ling lingering Unitarian families until a group under the guidance of the Unitarian Association's new fellowship movement, which established themselves as a new fellowship here in Boise, a movement which was part of Unitarianism's growth and westward expansion post-World War II. Reverend John Mitchell's seeds began to grow, thoughtfully nurtured and tended in the living rooms of the new Unitarians who'd found kindred spirits in this religion and made space for doubts and questions, for agnostics and atheists, humanists and theists, 
those who'd abandoned other traditions, questioning doctrine and dogma, but still seeking community. But being a Unitarian in the late 50s and early 60s in Idaho wasn't without its challenges. Not only did the small membership take on every task of running the fellowship, from newsletters to religious education to music and coordinating guest speakers every Sunday, but they were the progressive vanguard, exploring some of the toughest, most controversial issues of the day. Some of the guest speakers they would invite from the College of Idaho declined the invitation, feeling their jobs would be in danger if they came to speak to this stalwart group of liberal freethinkers. The Unitarians were earning a reputation, one that would be proudly carried forward growing with each new decade. But they persevered. And just six years after organizing this fledgling lay-led Unitarian Fellowship in May 1961, they officially incorporated, declaring themselves a religious organization, filing their paperwork with the state of Idaho. And as I mentioned, that very same weekend as this fellowship's incorporation, another historic moment occurred in our faith tradition. That final vote of ratification, merging the American Unitarian Association and the Universalist Church of America, took place in Boston, a moment decades in the making. Just as this fellowship was coming into its own, Unitarian Universalism was born a merger that brought together the more rational, stoic, and intellectual Unitarians with the more religious, pious, and emotive Universalists. While the merger was supported by a vast majority, many Universalists still felt swallowed up by the Unitarians, as we heard one of those ministers reflect earlier. And still today, some of those vestiges remain as we often abbreviate ourselves to Unitarian to mean Unitarian Universalism. And as one seventh generation Universalist matriarch retorts, Unitarian is the adjective that describes what kind of Universalists we are. On that Sunday worship service, Reverend Daniel Harrington of New York Community Church preached the sermon during that annual meeting after the vote of consolidation. And he spoke to the moment as a cross between a new birth, a marriage, a commencement, and a kind of death of sorts, as members detached from singular identities and institutions, combining our histories and legacies into new forms and structures. It was a union of grand hope and vision, as well as necessity. Both denominations were small by comparison to mainline Protestant denominations, and both were struggling financially. We needed one another. The denominations had been collaborating and flirting with consolidation since the early 1930s, sharing hymnals and resources. The senior high youth programs had officially voted on their own merger 10 years earlier, in 1951, forming LRY, the Liberal Religious Youth. In his sermon commemorating this moment, Reverend Harrington shared this enthusiastic description. It is our tremendous potential, born of the world's response to our new relevance, caused in turn by this new world's need for a religion which is dynamic instead of static, unitive instead of divisive, universalistic instead of particularistic, history-making rather than history-bound. I say it is our tremendous potential, and the feeling of its surge and excitement in us and in our churches that made this Unitarian Universalist merger necessary and indeed inevitable. Looking forward from this place, what do I see? I see the need for us to brace ourselves, to absorb the shock of the incredible growth which will accompany our newly won relevance. It may have been inevitable, 
but the incredible growth and newly won relevance might have been a bit overly optimistic. It didn't quite happen that way. We haven't had a surge in growth. In fact, we've remained flat for most of these years. But we all need a good hype man. And Reverend Harrington's rousing predictions no doubt stirred the hearts and minds of all of those who would be part of this new era and who need it and still need that surge of vision and excitement, that forward look to what is possible. In 1961, this fellowship had just incorporated itself as the Boise Unitarian Fellowship. I doubt it was paying a ton of attention to the growing national conversations around consolidation and merger, instead choosing to focus on staking their own religious claim in the Boise landscape. It wasn't until 1968 that they officially added universalism to their name. And because they began as decidedly a Unitarian fellowship with their own identity anchored in that intellectual rationalism and resistance to organized institutional religion, they too had to wrestle with their own changing identity, figuring out how to tell our story, how to tell their story to themselves and to newcomers in this larger context of Unitarian Universalism and all that it represented. They had to wrestle with how they might build a future they could not yet see and keep on moving forward, inhabiting multiple spaces, attending protests, answering the call of love, revising bylaws, marrying and burying members, welcoming new members, who would become our matriarchs and patriarchs, holding tight to that invisible thread of love that connects us all. We are a people who build on the legacy of our founders. They are our foundation. As our denomination matures, we see that we are a people who can look inward and reckon with the corrections needed to build a more expansive story for ourselves, even as we build stronger connections within our community to help it prosper. We make a space during our service for this generosity of spirit to move us to give to this self-sustaining community. And we delight that a portion of our weekly offering can support this month's plate partner, Life's Kitchen, which encourages its benefactors to imagine new stories for themselves, and which this weekend moved into their new location, complete with the public cafe. We thank you for your generous giving today and always.
This is my reflection on the theme of story. I taught English for 20 years, and to this day, I'm not really sure what I was teaching. Was I teaching students how to spell and decode words? Or to appreciate all the different meanings of words? How they can carry associations and significance well beyond the dictionary definition? Was I teaching students how to read or write? Once I complimented a student's writing to his mother and she interpreted it as complimenting his penmanship. Again, word meanings can be awfully subjective. And regarding writing, was I teaching students academic writing, the logical steps of critical analysis and argument? Or might I engage them in writing by assigning a memoir, a story, poetry? How about creative nonfiction? Was I teaching grammar and usage so that they could ascend in the meritocracy, which was after all the original intent behind grammar schools? Was I teaching them how to mine a novel or play for deeper meaning beyond plot and action? More significantly, was I reinforcing the values of Western civilization or teaching them to question those very values? Just what is this vast and unwieldy subject we require students to study for 12 years? This is strange because even now the subject is being de-emphasized and defunded in our universities at a staggering rate. This motivation for defunding the English departments and for pushing back against the core standards movement stems in part from the mistaken belief that some of us harbor hatred for this country and promote this hatred with what many criticize as critical race theory and social justice and wokeism. These terms have taken on all sorts of distortions and now represent something else and entirely menacing. Their connotations have erased the denotations. We English teachers reveal this process too, how language evolves to reflect and critique culture even while it's creating it. I'll leave the term social justice and wokeism for another time, but let me address critical race theory briefly here. Critical race theory is one of 20 or so approaches to how to read a story. And since it's through the stories we tell that we reinforce cultural norms, it is important to recognize that stories contain all sorts of unconscious biases and assumptions about the way the world works. Some other literary theories ask a reader to enter into the mindset of a feminist or a queer person, for example, and to read the story looking not just for the universal theme and meaning, but also looking to uncover the assumptions of the culture that gave rise to that story. Critical theories ask the reader to step away from the story itself and to examine how it defines a hero and what it considers good and laudable and what it considers evil. It's very meta, as we say, which means it is teaching critical thinking and teaching in a way, it in a way that discomforts many. Perhaps we are not comfortable coming to the realization that what we consider moral absolutes is to another group or culture merely idiosyncratic mores. And what we prize as ultimate values is experienced by another culture as destructive to their way of life. One man's religion is another's mythology and we don't like to be reminded of this. After all, where might it lead to moral relativity? Might it undermine the credibility of a people's story to realize it is just a story? 
These are important questions, but the uninformed and reactionary discussion the legislature has had this session accusing teachers, even preschool teachers, of indoctrination is dangerously misleading and meant to foster suspicion and fear. But what does all this have to do with the Unitarians and Universalists whose merger we are celebrating in today's service? Well, these two peoples told themselves very different stories about what kinds of behaviors were heroic. Was a hero one who stoically preserved the integrity of her own mind, even to the point of social exclusion? Or was a hero one who yielded with love to include all kinds of thoughts and beliefs? Was the rational mind the lodestar for truth or was it the heart? It's amazing that these two cultures were able to find common ground and agree on what they shared. What they shared was a belief that this life right here, right now mattered, not some afterlife, but this life for every human, for every creature. It led them to concentrate on that much vilified concept, social justice. Moreover, it has led us all to examine the assumptions and biases that we are unconsciously accepting as truth about the way our contemporary society has come to be constructed. Call it critical race theory or post-colonial theory, feminist theory, queer theory, or even now ecological theory, we you use are expanding our repertoire of lenses through which we can see, experience, and love the world. We are opening up to the possibility of more stories. Now we are all doing the meta work of language. We are all English majors now. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Deborah. This legislative session has been frustrating and disheartening, to say the least. And still, it is our Unitarian Universalist commitments and values and faith that drives me and so many of us in all regions of the world to keep fighting injustice. Here we are, 60 years later telling the stories of our past and integrating them into the evolving stories we want to tell about who we are today and who we wish to become. And there are times when it feels like little has changed in the story of advancing justice. And yet, the story of our commitment to justice, locally, nationally, globally, is a common thread from our past our commitment to bringing our liberal religious voices to the public square, voices fueled by science and reason, by a resolve to defend human dignity and worth, by a sense of deep neighbor love for all people that resists those very most cruel notions of religion and government that prevail throughout this state. While we can look back at all that has changed in 60 years and 100 years, we can also see that unbroken line of hope, love, and a commitment to justice. A few years after the Unitarian Universalist merger and consolidation, in the midst of the growing civil rights and black power movements, in the years following some of the most significant upheaval and uprisings around race at the time. Events that included the Harlem riots, the assassination of Malcolm X, the murder of Jimmy Lee Jackson, Bloody Sunday, the Watts riots, the Newark riots, all of those within a span of four and a half years, followed by the assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In those years following a great controversy erupted about how our new association would respond to the call for black empowerment, black caucus spaces, and funding for black-led projects and initiatives, both within our ranks and beyond our walls in our, in our communities. 
The controversy was such that it spurred a massive walkout during the 1968 annual General Assembly. Our own Gwyn Reed remembers being an alternate delegate as a youth at that time, and her parents, John and Vi Harms, were delegates on behalf of this fellowship. Having traveled all the way to Boston, they joined more than 400 other delegates who walked out in solidarity with their African-American counterparts. Gwyn remembers her parents sharing that experience with this fellowship and that it was life-changing and deeply meaningful for them. And here we are again in this 21st century, contending with the continued legacies of violence and harm caused by deep systemic racism and cultural white supremacy, even in our own Unitarian Universalist Association and embedded in our UU legacy and identity. Some say this current controversy is tearing us apart. Others say it undermines our democratic principles. Others accuse us of discarding our history, of making racial justice our creed. But what if we saw this current struggle as the next iteration of our history? the continued learning from our past as part of our evolution, our living tradition as we create the story of our future, a future that is anti-racist, free from the hierarchies and supremacies that have existed for thousands of years. Whenever big, seemingly tumultuous changes come and challenge the stories we've told ourselves about, who we are, resistance is a byproduct. We see it today in our legislature, but we've experienced it too in our Unitarian Universalist landscape. When Unitarians and Universalists defended abolition and harbored so-called fugitive slaves, many cried, wait, go slow. Some of our own venerated heroes still professed differences between the races, and some of those heroes kept people enslaved in their own homes and properties. Some left our communities behind in anger. When women fought for the right to be ordained ministers, and the Universalist Church ordained the first woman, and later, as more women entered our Unitarian Universalist ministry, some cried, wait, this will change our very nature. Some ignored the women and shunned them and wondered aloud who would care for the children. Some left our communities behind in anger. When pagans and Wiccans and earth-centered spirituality wove its way into our UU space, feeling that call of religious freedom, some said, wait, but we are historically Christian. Some brushed them off as silly and frivolous, pushing them to the margins. Some left our communities in anger. And when our LGBTQ siblings found a home, testing the waters of inclusion, some said, wait, we don't understand. Some pretended not to see. Some left our communities behind in anger. When the rationalism, humanism, and resistance to Christianity began to crack open, making room for spirituality, reverence, prayer, the Bible, and reclaiming religious language, some said, wait, this is not who we are. Some resisted, some pushed out ministers, some refused to try, some left our communities behind in anger. And yet all along the way, Brave souls stayed with it and forged ahead, willing to be changed, willing to listen, willing to experiment, willing to practice. Even here at this fellowship, brave souls stayed with it and forged the way to craft a congregational resolution opposing the Vietnam War and opposing the proposition denying equal rights to LGBTQ folks. Brave souls were arrested in the streets of downtown, in the Capitol, and on the US-Mexico border. 
Brave souls welcomed an asylum seeker and pledged themselves to dismantling racism and building beloved multicultural community. Brave souls have joined UU Bible study and meditation and quest and the pagan nature group and shared other spiritual journeys. Brave souls have prayed with their bodies and been willing to say amen. Brave souls have held fast to the core of who we are, a core that goes back to the earliest moments of Unitarianism and Transylvania and Universalism in England, the core of religious freedom and pluralism. Without creed, without dogma, the core of a spirit of love and salvation for all the core of a relentless pursuit of liberty and justice for all, inspired by our religious legacy. And like our ancestors before us, the Unitarians, the Universalists, and the Unitarian Universalists, we continue to be the vanguard on the forefront of every progressive social issue of our time proudly. And we have not always gotten it right. We've botched some things along the way. We have often stumbled over our own hubris and arrogance, but we've tried to keep stumbling in the right direction. And we've always believed the world can be better and we can be part of making it better. And we commit to this faith tradition because we want to be with other people who believe that too. We want to share in that vision and connect our lives to that ideal to that story in community together. 60 years later, we are still working a few things out. We're still figuring out who we are, our UU identity. We're still asking more questions than providing answers. We're still welcoming the radical spirit and seekers of all kinds. We're still embodying our commitment to this living tradition that can evolve and adapt with the changing times. A. Powell Davies, that revered minister that you heard referenced in our first video, a Unitarian evangelist and activist who served the All Souls Church in Washington, D.C. from 1944 to 1957, wrote these words. He said, we are the consummation of thousands of years of religious history. We are thousands of years that have stripped off superstition and have battled tyranny, that have marched sometimes joyfully, sometimes in agony, towards spiritual emancipation. Yet in this world of blood and sorrow, it is hardly worth mentioning, unless, in addition, we are the beginning of something, unless our religion is new. Oh, this work must not fail. We have a legacy worthy of our continued care and attention. How shall we nurture and tend to it? What lessons can we learn from our past? And what legacies do we want to create for future generations of Unitarian Universalists? How will we work to build that future so our UU faith can continue to be a voice for liberal values for another 100 years or more? What story do we hope future Unitarian Universalists will tell about us 60 years from now? May we continue to tell a story of love everlasting, of a, a universal love for all people, May we continue to tell a story of a people dedicated to the pursuit of truth and meaning, to bringing hope into the dark spaces and giving life the shape of justice. Always and forever, may this be the story of us. Amen.
I invite you to join me in the spirit of prayer and meditation. Spirit of life and love, holy mystery, we hold in our hearts the joys and sorrows of this beloved community, those gathered together this morning, and those who are not with us, but who remain in our hearts. As we breathe together, we hear the whispers of our past. We breathe the breath of our ancestors. Those courageous few who tended the flames of our faith through clear skies and through the storms. Those who opened their hearts and souls with courage, conviction, and love, who saw a vision and kept moving forward. We feel them all around us in this home that love made, in the trees and flowers and secret pathways, in the quiet spaces of our hearts. We feel them when we cross our little bridge, carrying our wishes for the world, connecting us to our past and to our people across an ocean. We feel them all around us holding up the vision when we are too tired. As we knit together the threads of our history and heritage, our present and our hopes for the future moving forward through the ages, they are with us always. They too saw a broken and hurting world. They too marched for justice. They too prayed for peace. They too demanded equality. We carry the flame now, forever burning with their embers. Their legacy is ours to continue, to mold and shape for a new generation. We carry them with us always. May we be vessels of comfort and compassion. May we be vessels of peace and justice. May we be vessels of hope and healing. May love prevail. In the name of all that is holy, we pray. Amen. to one another that we journey not alone joy and sorrow make us wise kin to all that lives and dies love calls us
I invite you to place your hands over your heart for our closing blessing. I offer you these words from the venerable Ray Bradbury. Everyone must leave something behind when they die, something your hand touched some way so your soul has somewhere to go when you die. It doesn't matter what you do so long as you change something from the way it was before you touched it into something that's like you after you take your hands away. May hope always call us on. May faith always call us on. May life always call us on. May love always call us on. Blessed are we all. Go in peace. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Don't forget to come and celebrate with us next Saturday and please stick around for our congregational meeting. Um, why don't we give ourselves a 10 minute break to have a stretch, have a bio break while the board and I ready ourselves for the meeting. So we'll come back together to start our meeting at 1135.